You may be seated. Today, we live in a society that would rather cancel than listen, would rather dig up old sins than see repentance, would rather point the finger than look inside. The gospel teaches us something very different. God, the very creator of the universe, has given us a gift we simply don't deserve. We haven't earned it. We haven't purchased it. As a matter of fact, it was purchased for us. And all we need to do is accept it. Well, man, it's so good to see so many of you all here today. How many of y'all are excited to be in church today? Yes. I want you all to know I am drinking coffee, which those of you guys that have not been here this past year, that doesn't really mean much to you, but those of us that have been without coffee for more than a year, it is back. So, yes, yeah, so we, yes, I love it. And, and I want to thank our, our hospitality team for making that possible um, and everything. It's just amazing to see that back. Um, we are, those of you that this is your first time, my name is Dave, I'm one of the pastors here, and we are in a series, we're starting a brand new series today called Grace, God's Gift to a Judgmental Culture. It fits into our entire, our, our, our year-long theme is maturity. God is calling us to go deeper and grow up and, and uh, be, become more mature in our faith, that's what the focus of this year is, and this, this series uh, is going to be about six or seven parts. And I want to invite you guys, I'm already inviting you guys back next, next Sunday so that we can continue in this. But this is, today is part one, what's so amazing about grace? Um, the main thing is rules and religion are everywhere, but grace is only found through Christ. And we're going to talk about what that is. So uh, I found this awesome slide, this awesome picture of the most useless things ever. Check this out. Sign not in use. What is the, the balcony, whatever, that, and then guards at the tomb. Most useless things ever, amen? I mean, the guards at the tomb, there was no point in guarding the tomb because no human can stop what our Lord and Savior is doing. Um, okay, there was this guy who was uh, at the airport. He's working the crowd, and he was going up to people, and he was saying, hey, excuse me, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? Do you know Jesus? Are you saved? Get to different people. And he found this older guy sleeping, and his hat over his face, and Goes up to the guy and wakes him up and says, excuse me, sir, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? And the older guy, goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I do. Pretty sure I'm saved. Well, the younger guy wasn't having that. He goes, excuse me, sir, you either, you're either in or you're out. You either know or you don't. So can you tell me, sir, the exact date that you were saved? And the guy kind of rubs his eyes and goes, well, don't know exactly. Seems to me it's about 2,000 years ago. Put his hat back over his face, went back to sleep. And that's exactly what happened. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked out of an empty, walked out of a tomb. The tomb is empty. He's resurrected. And guys, that was the beginning of grace. That was the beginning of this thing called grace. So what, what big major problem did the resurrection solve? The resurrection of Jesus Christ solved the ultimate problem in the universe. Okay? It's a tough question for us humans, though, because... Humans, we're very self-centered. That's where we are. Anybody knows that. We're all, we're all about us. We like to, to, to make everything about us. And a problem to us humans, to us people, a problem is when our rights or our wants or our needs or our wishes aren't met. That's what a problem is. That's how we define a problem. Okay? And as long as that's how you define a problem, the resurrection of Christ will just be a really nice thing that God did for us. But it wasn't really necessary, all right? After all, we aren't Adolf Hitler. We're not Joseph Stalin. We're not uh, Chairman Mao. Uh, we're not any of those people. So why do we need the resurrection? Why do we need grace? Well, the gospel, however, has a radically different starting point. I want you guys to hear this. Imagine that. God doesn't look at problems the same way we do. God starts at a very different place. God was facing the ultimate problem of the universe, and that was this. God's ultimate problem was how to deal rightly with wrongs committed. How to deal rightly with wrongs committed. If you go to Romans chapter 3, verse 25, 
It says, Paul writes this, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness, talking about grace, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. All right. So every, every murder, every sin, every kidnapping, every, has gone unpunished. Well, God obviously can't do that. I wanted to take you to the year 1945, Nuremberg trials. Nuremberg trials were the trials that were the, 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 the people that made the Holocaust happen, the Third Reich were put on trial for crimes against humanity, all right? And it's some of the worst of atrocities in human history. And these guys were being held accountable for it. You had Adolf Eichmann, and you had Himmler, and you had uh, Hermann Goring, and all the Nazi officials that were up there. And they were guilty beyond imagine. Can you imagine if the judge had looked at all of them and said, the evidence against you is overwhelming, but as long as you promise not to do it again, we'll let you go free. What would people have done to that judge? That judge would not be sitting on the bench very long. That judge would probably be torn to pieces by a mob if that's what had happened. So that God is in a big, big dilemma. It's like, how do I maintain justice as well as shower love on the people that I created? How do I do this? Because, see guys, if God, God, God is two things, the first thing, God is love. His love for you is unapproachable in its infinity. First John 4, 16 says this, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. God loves you more than you could ever imagine. But the second thing is that God is holy, holy. First John 1, 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. His nature cannot tolerate sin. It, he can't be any part of it, okay? So he's got a problem. See, if God was all love, then he would just excuse everything. He would look at mass murders and kidnappers and rapists and say, you guys just go do your thing. I love you. And if he was all holy, he would cast every one of us to hell for the sins we've committed, okay? So he's in this quandary, so what does he do? So God decides to do something. He decides to solve the problem and introduce a thing called grace. And this thing called grace is his solution to this problem. He, he says this, I'm going to maintain my justice and I'm going to shower love on my people and this is how I'm gonna do it. I'm going to take my only son that I love and I'm going to send him to earth and I'm gonna kill him in the most gruesome manner possible, the crucifixion, and he's gonna take all of the sin of humanity, and when he dies, all the sin of humanity is gonna to die too, and three days later, he's gonna walk out of the tomb renewed and offer that to my people. That's how I'm going to shower love on my people as well as maintain justice. That's what his solution is, and it's a thing called grace. Easter Sunday was an introduction of God's solution to the ultimate problem, grace. Romans 5, 19 said this, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, meaning Adam, the many were made sinners, so also the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. God's solution, like I said, was to take his only son, perfect and holy, and put all of your sin and my sin and the Nazis' sin and the uh, uh, atrocities of, of the, of the, of the 6,000 years of human history on one person and let it die. When I was a youth minister, I used to ask my students, who's the most evil person that ever lived? And I always got the same response. I got Adolf Hitler, I got Joseph Stalin, I got Chairman Mao. One student said, Miss McCowan, my algebra teacher. And those were some evil people. It sounds like Miss McCallum was especially evil. But I would tell them that they were all wrong, every one of them. And they would look at me and, and, and I said, the most evil person that ever lived was, ironically, the one who never committed a sin in his life. His name was Jesus Christ. <gasps> and everybody would, would you know, take a breath. How could you, did, did he just say that Jesus was the most evil person ever? Like, yes, because on the cross, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus took our sin. The Bible says he became sin. He became sin. He became every rapist, every murder, every mass murder, every communist dictator, every liar, every cheat, every abuser, every uh, that ever lived. He became that on the cross. And when he died, all of that died with him, past, present, 
and future. And when he rose again on Easter Sunday, he conquered death and gave us the ability to be made pure. New creations in Christ. That's what grace is, you guys. But there are four aspects of grace that we have to understand. Because a lot of people don't understand grace. There are four things. The first thing is that grace is not cheap. Grace is not cheap. Jude 4 says this, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about a long time ago has secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. I wonder how long it took for humanity to take this gift of grace and turn it around to, 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 to this. Probably not long. Probably a couple weeks, I'd say. I, 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 you know, I will never forget turning 16 years old and going for the driver's license. This thing right here, a driver's license. This is the ultimate badge of freedom for the teenager. This is the thing that we look forward to from age five on. The driver's license meant freedom, meaning that we could do whatever we wanted, right? Go wherever we wanted. That's what the driver's license says. And I'll, I'll, what, what the Bible says and what you and I know to be true is that many people take this grace of God and use it as a license to do whatever we want. Matter of fact, one guy said this. He goes, I love to sin. God loves to forgive. What a great deal. As somebody who thinks grace is cheap, grace is free, but it is not cheap. In fact, it may be the most expensive thing we've ever received. Not only the grace license, but there are people that treat grace like a grace credit card. Please do not tell Dave Ramsey I have one of these. People look at grace like a credit card with an unlimited, with, with no limit. I can do what I want, swipe the grace credit card and Jesus will pay for it. Never incur a debt. Swipe the grace credit card and Jesus will pay for it. Those are people that don't understand grace. See, the purpose of grace is not to free you to do whatever you want. Romans 2.4 says this, you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. What the purpose of grace is, is to be so in awe of God's kindness, what he's done for us, that we just, that, that, that we say, after what you've done for me, there's nothing I won't do for you. That's the purpose of it. You know, I was thinking about this this week, and I'm amazed at how vulnerable God got with grace. Vulnerable. You're saying God, yes. God got so vulnerable with grace because he knows, he knows us. He knows the human heart better than we know ourselves. He knew that as soon as he gave this gift of grace to us, there'd be people that would take advantage of it and use it and abuse it. He knew that, yet he gave it to us anyway and trusted this gift of grace to us, kind of like a, a kid that tosses the key to his, to his Corvette to his 16-year-old kid, knowing the heart of his son, knowing that 16-year-olds always drive too fast and recklessly, but saying, son, I trust you. I trust you with this gift. I'm putting it in your hands, and I want you to use it wisely. How vulnerable, how vulnerable God got. When I think of that, the gift of grace, I think of God as the greatest risk taker in the world. Because he's, what, a, what a risk he took giving us the gift of grace. He, it's like he's saying here, humanity, here, my greatest gift, grace. Paying for your sins so you don't have to. Don't abuse it. Cherish it. Honor it. Don't treat it as cheap because it wasn't cheap. It cost me a lot. So don't look at it as cheap. Second aspect of grace, that it's not fair. Not fair. First Peter 2, 21 to 24 says this, to, you, to, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He, con he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. I'm a parent and I was a kid at one point and I was always told life isn't fair. How many of you parents have told your kids life is not fair? How many of you all have heard the term life isn't fair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it is very true. And anyone who tells you anything different is selling you something. All right, and most of the time it's said in negative context. Something bad happens, life isn't fair, right? Well, grace isn't fair either. 
but it's one of the few times that life is unfair in your favor. I want you guys to hear this. First Peter, we continue. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, we have been healed. He, t- he took it, not us. My freshman year in seminary, I had just gotten married, and uh, my wife and I had absolutely no money at all. Like, hot dogs and mac and cheese were fine dining back then, all right? And, uh, um, and I was in, going to Asbury Seminary. It was my first year, and I ran a stop, well, like, the only stop sign in Wilmore, I think. And the chief of police pulled me over, and he walked up, and, he, and I'm like, Man, I am sunk. I can't afford a, 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 a ticket. I can't afford this. I mean, what, what am I going to do? And he walks up and he sees my books. I just come from class. And he asked if I was a seminary student. I said, yeah. It turns out he was taking some classes. And we started talking about some things. And then he said, I'm going to teach you a lesson that you'll never learn in seminary. He goes, it's a thing called grace. He handed me a warning. I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But as I drove away, I asked, I realized, was that grace? No, it wasn't grace. In order for it to have been grace, this is what would have to have happened. Imagine you get pulled over for speeding. Cop runs your license, comes back and says, Mr. Keebler, I clocked you at 20 miles over the limit. That'll be a $200 fine, six points on your license, and a suspension of your license for 30 days for reckless driving. I look at him and say, I can't afford that. Can't, I, that, that fine might well be $200,000. I can't afford that. The cop would look at me and say, well, I have good news, sir. I found a driver who has never sped, never gotten a ticket, and has a perfect driving record. He's already paid the $200. He's already taken the points on his license. And he's already had his license suspended for 30 days. You are free to go. And look at the cop and say, that's, that's insane. Who, who would do that? The cop would look at me and say, me. I did it. You're free to go. That would have been grace. Now, I didn't go back and find the chief of police and explain that to him. I didn't do that. But you understand that the only one who is able to give you grace is the one that should be consigning you to hell, right? The, the one that is licensed, the one is, who has the ability to execute justice on you is the one that can extend grace. That is what grace is. Grace is not fair, but it's one of the few times life is unfair in your favor. Grace is not cheap. Grace is not fair, but grace is sufficient. Number three, grace is sufficient. Second Corinthians 12, 9 says this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Okay, the apostle Paul is having a crisis. There was this thing, a messenger from Satan, the Bible says, called a thorn in his flesh, sent to torment him. And it was really bugging him. It was really bothering him. It was hindering his ministry. And he pleaded with God. I can just see Apostle Paul. God, I have this thorn in my flesh. We don't know what it was. Maybe it was a caustic personality. Maybe it was blindness. Maybe it was a physical ailment. We don't know what it was. But it, it was a thorn in his flesh. And Paul goes, Lord, I've got this thorn in my flesh. And I'm down here trying to do your work. I'm trying to win the world for you. I'm trying to plant churches. I'm trying to win people to Christ. Lord, if you could just take this away from me, I could do so much better work. And, the, and God looks at him and says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul, you know, kind of scratches his head and goes, okay, well, maybe God didn't understand. Maybe I need to explain things to him. Isn't that great when we try to explain things to God like he doesn't know? So, so Paul asked a second time, he's like, okay, okay, God, maybe I wasn't clear. I've got this thorn in my flesh, and it's killing me, and I need you to take it away. I'm pleading with you to take it away. Second time, God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
This time, Paul's really lost. He goes to God a third time and said, all right, God, gloves are off here. Um, I need help. Do you understand this thing is killing me? I need you to take it away. I'm begging you. I'm pleading you to take this away. Third time, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And finally, Paul begins to understand something. He begins to understand something that a lot of us in this room never figure out. And it's this, that when God says his grace is sufficient, he means it. I want to ask the people in this room and online, what if God never did anything for you other than save you from your sins and ensure you a place in heaven when you die? What if that's the only thing he ever did for you? What if he, he never, for you single people, never sent you the man or woman of your dreams? What if he never did? What if for, for you couples that are struggling to get pregnant, and there are a lot of them, um, what if he never enabled you to have children? What if you never got the dream job? What if you never got the promotion? What if you never, what, what if you never had the kind of friends you think you should have? What if your kids don't turn out well? What if God never answers yes to a prayer you pray ever again? Paul said, I've realized that the grace of God is sufficient. I'm content if God never gives me anything else. His grace is sufficient. See, guys, grace soothes the restless heart, the discontent heart, because you realize you need nothing else. Grace soothes the unsatisfied soul. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. There's so many people in this room and listening online and in this world who just can't ever be content with anything. They don't realize that God's grace is sufficient because God's grace, we, have, we can have peace in this world. We can settle our souls. We don't have to live in panic and anxiety and fear like so many people do. Grace is sufficient. My grace is not cheap, God says. My grace is not fair. My grace is sufficient and last and the most amazing one. Grace is why we worship. Grace is why we worship. Romans 3, 23 through 24 tells us exactly our our, our state before God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Just a little bit ago, we sang some praises to God as a church. We do that every Sunday. A lot of times, do that daily. How many of y'all came to worship night on Wednesday? That was was an awesome time, wasn't it? All right. How many of y'all prayed this week? Anybody spend time in prayer this week? Yeah, probably a lot of us. Okay. You understand that, and we've lived with that for so long, you don't understand what an anomaly that is, that you could actually approach God, that you could actually be invited into his throne room with praise and with prayer. You understand that that's not normal, that's not the norm? See, I found this out when I was a little kid. Um, I, 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 as a kid, my favorite phrase was, that's not fair. How many of y'all have kids that, that, that uh, um, you know, your, their favorite phrase is, that's not fair? Basically, that means I didn't get what I wanted. Yeah, that's what that means, all right? And I used to tell my mom and dad, that's not fair. That's not fair. And, when, and then in school, I learned about this amazing thing called the Supreme Court. It was awesome. I found out that if you didn't like one judgment, you could appeal it, and then you could appeal it again, and then you, if you could take it all the way to the Supreme Court, and if the Supreme Court overruled, then then everything else was null and void because the Supreme Court was it. It's a final say. So I would be in saying, Mom, that's not fair. I'm taking this to the Supreme Court. I don't want to clean my room. Mom, I'm taking this to the Supreme Court. Right, you want me to mow the grass? No, I don't. That's not fair. I'm taking this to the Supreme Court. My parents kind of put up with it for a little while. And then after a while, my mom actually sat down and said, David, do you understand that you can't go to the Supreme Court except by invitation. They will not listen to your case unless they invite you. Like, people appeal to the Supreme Court all the time, but they don't hear every case. They only hear cases they invite in. 
So if you're going to take this to the Supreme Court, you are going to have to be invited by the Supreme Court. I'm like, oh, man. Well, they haven't invited me yet. We can't even get an invitation to the Supreme Court. What makes us think we can have an invitation to the throne room of God? It is only by the grace of God only by the grace of God that we're even allowed to pray, that we're even allowed to sing praises to God. How many of us have like, kind of taken that for granted? Like, you know, how many of you all have kind of grumbled, like, oh, man, God wants me to pray again. I don't really feel like praying right now. What's wrong with us? How many of you all have grumbled about a worship service? Uh, you know, hey, um, you know, I, don't, I just don't like that song. It's not, that song just doesn't do anything for me. You understand? It's only by invitation. They're even allowed to worship by the grace of God. Grace is why we have an audience with the king of the universe, why we can approach the throne room. We, can, we are ushered into his presence when we praise, when we pray, when we sing, when we worship, when we give, when everything. These are things that are made possible by the grace of God. There would be no relationship with God without it. Grace is why we worship. Maybe we need to start looking at worship differently. Maybe we need to start looking at prayer differently. This is not an obligation. This is something that we only get to do by invitation. So next time you pray, next time you lift your voice in a worship song, next time you give, realize that it's a privilege, not an obligation. I was asked by a rather honest atheist friend of mine several years ago, I was telling him about my Christian faith, and he said, well, David, what, what would it take you to walk away from Christianity? What, was, what would it take you to become an atheist? And my initial thought was nothing. There's nothing that would. But then before I said anything, I stopped, and I said, no, there's actually one thing. There's one thing that would cause me to walk away from Christ would cause me to deny faith, become an, an adamant atheist overnight, and walk away from faith altogether. He said, well, what is it? And I said this, if they found the body of Jesus. He goes, the body of Jesus? And, 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 and I said, yeah, let me explain. I said, some people leave the faith because church hurts them. Yeah, I've been hurt by the church, still here. Uh, some people leave the faith because a pastor falls into immorality or, or, or this kind of thing. I mean, I, I've seen that. You have too, still here. Some people, uh, because of high-profile deconversions of Christian pop stars, come on, y'all. If y'all if y'all's faith in Christ is contingent on a pop star and their faith, you got the wrong faith. That's not it. I said, if, but if they found the body of Jesus, some archaeologists, a team of archaeologists went over to Jerusalem and they found a tomb and th somehow through DNA or carbon print or you know, whatever, they could actually determine that it's the body of Jesus of Nazareth. I would walk away. I would walk out these doors. I would resign from being a pastor of this church and I would never set foot in a church again and spend the rest of my life never believing another thing. And you say, well, why? Because if the body of Jesus is here on this earth, then everything Jesus was about is, a, is completely wrong. It's completely false. He was not a good teacher. He was a fraud. And everything he said was a sight job, and it was completely false, and it was, it was to deceive his followers if they found the body of Jesus. You understand that the significance of today, without the resurrection, without the empty tomb, there would be no Christian faith. I'd be the first one leading the exodus out the door if they could find the body of Jesus. But they can't. They can't find the body of Jesus because the tomb is empty. And because the tomb is empty, because Jesus was resurrected, God introduced his solution to the greatest problem on, on face, facing the universe. And it's a thing called grace that you and I have access to daily. Grace is not cheap. Grace is not fair. But grace is sufficient. And grace is why we worship There's some of you guys in here today who've never experienced this amazing grace, never accepted the grace of, that Jesus offers you. If you've never done that, I want to invite you to do that today. You just saw three people who accepted the grace of God into their lives for the first time today. Praise God. 
And if there are, if there are more people that need to do that today, if, 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 if you're like, yeah, I understand the tomb's empty, I understand that I'm a sinner, I understand that I am deserving of hell, and I need, I, I don't just need to fix a few things here, I know that I need to, I need to die, I need a good Friday myself, I need to die, and I need to be resurrected and made new, then, then this is the place for you, I want to talk to you after the service. But that is my invitation to you today, to accept this amazing thing called grace. And, and if you have never done that, don't leave this place without doing that. Grace is, grace is amazing. God's amazing 